Good morning. Now's the time to check your cell phones and turn them off. Everyone in the meeting should be wearing a face covering. I'm also asking that everyone who speaks from the dais or the podium to also wear their mask. Our vision statement is all our students achieve success in college, career, and life. The thought for today is, uh, is by Allison Crumley. Well, we do this one about twice a year, so it's time. Let's base all of our decisions on what is in the best interest of the students. If you stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, and now ask... Um, I'll now announce that all the members are present except for Chairman Altman, who has an excused absence. Now I ask for a moment of silence for personal reflection. Thank you. All right, is there any, either one of you want to speak on the COVID-19 notice? No, okay. no ma'am. All right, we have the minutes of the workshop and the regular meeting of November 17th. I, I need a motion to approve. I move to approve. Second. All right, uh, motion by Bodwin, second by Harding. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. It's now time for a public hearing on the student progression plan of 2020-21 uh, amendment. And I'll turn it over to attorney F uh, Alfonso. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is to announce the public comment portion of the student progression plan 2020-2021 amendment. Notice of this public hearing was posted in the district website and in publications in compliance with Florida statutes. Any member of the public who wishes to be heard on uh, this particular matter uh, should have already completed a green speaker request form that you can find as you enter the board lobby area um, and submit it to staff. When called, please approach the podium, state your name and address for the record. Uh, each speaker will have up to three minutes to speak unless an extension is granted by the board chair. I don't believe that we have received any green cards. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna announce that this is a public hearing, so if you are here to speak to this proposition, now would be the time to come forward. Madam Chair, let the record reflect that no one approaches the podium. All right, um, just a FYI, no vote will be taken uh, here today. There are no special presentations today, so we move directly into public comment on agenda items only. Madam Chair, I think the record can reflect that no requests for public comment on this uh, item are, were received. Okay, then we'll move on uh, to United School Board Employees of Pasco. Hello, Good morning. welcome. Good morning, uh, Mr. Superintendent, Vice Chairman Armstrong, Attorney Alfonso, and honorable school board members. This is her with a mask. Oh, no, <laughs> First of all, I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday with your family and enjoyed a well-deserved break from work, which we all needed. I think we can all agree that this semester and most of 2020 has been unlike any year any of us have ever experienced previously. We are all looking forward to what we hope is a safer, healthier 2021. And I'm here today in Don Peace's place as he is home recovering from a recent medical procedure. He sends his regards. Now, returning to work this week, we at the union office recognize that salary conversations for our employees and negotiations need to begin and hopefully we'll find a way to provide meaningful raises to all employees, uh, not just the employees that will benefit directly from the legislature's funding this year for newer teachers. While USEP will always appreciate additional funding, and clearly I think we all will acknowledge that, for all employees in this district, we must strive to ensure as best we can 
that equity of some kind be the objective as we are talking about long service teachers in SRP who do not, that do not benefit to the same extent as the newer employees under this newest plan. These employees have dedicated their working careers to this district and we believe it is incumbent on our part to do the best we can by them. We believe the district will agree with that approach and we hope that together we can work on a, a, a resolution that makes sense for everyone. On one important other note, I think we can all breathe a little sigh of relief. I think we all saw the executive order that came out yesterday that announced uh, from the DOE that funding for innovative programs such as My School Online here in Pasco County uh, will be funded for the remainder of this current school year. It's a good development, I think we'll all acknowledge. As you know, the issue of continued funding for these programs was somewhat in doubt until this order, so we should now be able to move PASCO and other districts uh, to continue with these programs during this pandemic year. Let's hope we don't have to deal with this next school year. And otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jim. All right, it's time for committee reports. We'll start with Mrs. Harding. I had none, thank you. I had none either, thanks. I had none. Well, I had to. Um, uh, investment Oversight Committee uh, met virtually. Uh, Mrs. Swenson uh, told the committee that the district uh, has received about $14 uh, million in grants for COVID-related expenses for this year, but there is a concern about the 21-22 budget. Our investment advisors reported that overall our investments are doing okay. Uh, we did discuss strategies to improve performance uh, so might be do, do better in the future. The uh, Employee Health and Wellness Committee also met. We reviewed uh, the goals from last year and how effective they were. Pretty much decided to stay with the goals that we have today and they'll just be tweaked a little bit. Uh, so that was also a good meeting. Now we move on to uh, Superintendent of Schools, Kurt Browning. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, members. Um, as uh, Mr. Ciadella had already mentioned, uh, that Commissioner Corcoran did release uh, his emergency order 07 yesterday. I just want the board to know and our public to know that it does allow for the continuation of our innovative le uh, learning model, which is My School Online, uh, for the second semester. It also holds districts harmless financially, uh, and I would add with some caveats. Um, we are still working through the details uh, of the order as it relates to the financial matters. Um, uh, additionally, we are required to submit the spring 2021 uh, education plan and assurances to the Department of Education no later than December 15th. Uh, needless to say, uh, uh, staff uh, is working uh, feverishly uh, to uh, not just submit a report but, uh, or a plan, but also submit a plan that uh, represents uh, how we're gonna support uh, all of our students and especially those struggling students. Uh, the plan will require specific steps uh, for progress monitoring. Uh, we know that, uh, but the department wants to ensure that uh, districts are monitoring uh, all of our students uh, and providing additional supports for our struggling students uh, throughout the district. Um, there, there's a, a great deal more uh, in this order. Um, we are, as I said, uh, tearing through it. We got it uh, about one, one ish yesterday. Um, found out about the press conference at 11. Yeah. Um, we got, uh, we watched the press conference. Uh, we received uh, the materials, and we're tearing through it right now and uh, putting together a very robust plan that just goes. Uh, further in demonstrating our support of all of our students. Um, one thing that, that is in there, uh, and the commissioner was very clear about it, uh, and that is is that uh, identifying uh, students that are not finding success in the virtual model and taking even more aggressive steps, that's my word, not his, um, at identifying those students and, and actually uh, making contact, an affirmative contact with parents, um, and then they have a choice to make based on the information that we provide to them about the academic status of their, of their student. They make the, the decision whether or not they're going to move back to bricks and mortar uh, classroom, traditional model, 
or they're going to keep their, their student uh, in the uh, My School Online, the innovative learning model. So uh, that is going to add another layer of complexity uh, to what, we, uh, what we're currently doing. We are doing that, uh, but it has not been as, um, as focused as the order requires us to do. Um, I will tell you there will be a district-wide approach to this. Uh, it will not be, uh, uh, there will not be different procedures in different schools, uh, whether you're a high school, a middle school, or an elementary school. Uh, there will be one procedure on how we're going to handle the outreach to the parent, how we're going to identify these struggling students, and uh, the contacts that we're going to be making uh, back to moms and dads uh, for decision-making uh, purposes. So that being said, that's where we find ourselves, and uh, we will, I will, uh, keep the board in the loop uh, as we move forward. Um, I know the staff has scheduled some time uh, next week uh, to uh, further work, some dedicated time. Uh, Ms. Hilton is now leading that charge, um, and uh, but they have dedicated, we've set some time aside next week uh, to uh, really dive into it and start putting everything you know into one document and be ready to submit on the 15th. May That's I, all I have, ma'am. May I ask something, Mrs. Armstrong? Sure, go right uh, ahead. I just wanted to ask if we could uh, try to get some extra support to, with the with the secondary folks because if they have to be calling or reaching out to all these families, we're going to have some schools and some teachers that have quite a bit more calls to make than than others, and if we can get somehow get some extra support to those schools and those teachers. Well, that's, Madam Chairman, if I may, yes. um, good question. Uh, I will tell you that is one of the issues that we're trying to um, figure out as far as uh, how we're going to communicate with parents. I haven't even talked to staff about this, but you know, there's got to be some affirmation. From, uh, do we send a certified letter home to moms and dads with a return receipt so that we have written confirmation that they've received it? Do we make phone calls? Who makes those phone calls? What information right. are we right. uh, sharing with them? What is the measure of success? Uh, and those are all issues that we're having to deal with, uh, with guidance from Tallahassee. Uh, but certainly, we understand that uh, uh, whether you're secondary or whether you're elementary, uh, they're, they're, it's, it's going to look different than anything that we've done up to this point. Okay. And quite honestly, we don't have a lot of time. We have uh, right. two weeks yeah. from today to get that plan submitted yeah. uh, to the department. Uh, that's why time is of the essence. Uh, kind of some things have been put on hold while we try to get uh, this, this plan put together. But even with the plan, there's going to be some internal things that we've got to figure out yeah. as far as what that communication looks like um, okay. and uh, so that we can meet the requirements of uh, the emergency order. Yeah, because it did sound like they wanted us to try to talk them into coming back to traditional. Did you, is that how you interpreted it? Uh, Madam Chairman, if I may, he, he, uh, yes, uh, he was yeah. very, very clear in his message yesterday that kids need back in bricks and mortar classrooms. Um, I will tell you that uh, I understand that where we find ourselves with COVID, particularly uh, on December 1st, 2020 with COVID, uh, I understand why there are parents right. that uh, do not want to come back into a bricks and mortar environment. Let me just reiterate though, based on data that we saw at our last board workshop, uh, the, the numbers uh, because of the measures and steps that we've taken as a district have been relatively low. If you remember, uh, the numbers of, yeah. of kids, students, was about a half, half a percent. percent. Yeah. Um, and so what we're finding is that the cases that we're seeing coming into the school are in large part, not all, but in large part coming from outside coming in. There's one of our high schools where I think the week before Thanksgiving we ended up having to send 10 or 12 positive cases home that were directly tied back to a birthday party. Uh, you go by parks and ball fields, uh, and you will see full parks and ball fields. And I might add, with no mask, or very few masks. Um, so uh, I've been in constant contact with uh, Mr. Napier, the County Health Department Director, and uh, he is um, he's concerned about the direction uh, that we're headed, not we as a district, but we as a community are headed uh, with COVID cases. And so we as a district are trying to take whatever steps we can to ensure the safety of our students and staff. Um, and I don't know how I got onto the COVID discussion, but um, we, we do know that uh, the commissioner was pretty clear yesterday in his assessment uh, 
uh, of uh, kids that uh, are struggling. They need to be back in a bricks and mortar environment. Um, or they need to make some drastic changes and their work habits. At, right. Yeah, well, we do online, have, and, right? and this is. I, and I'm saying that the students I'm yeah. talking about. Yes, ma'am, uh, yeah. ma'am, chair, sure, if I may, the um, we have obviously our my school online looks totally different than what we looked like the fourth quarter of last school year. Oh, yes. Uh, it's much more, uh, uh, I won't say rigid, but much uh, more structured. structured. It's much more structured than it was. Uh, and I think that's what, no, I don't think, I know for a fact because of our thought exchange and all the, the parent and teacher information that we received over the summer, uh, they wanted structure. They wanted structure, and we gave them structure. But there still has to be parents taking the initiative with their children and students needing right. to take the initiative when you get into the older grades, the, the, the secondary grade levels primarily, uh, knowing that if they need to be in Algebra 1 at, at 8 o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday, on a computer, that's where they need to be. Uh, and if we had time, we could tell you story after story after story about things that teachers have experienced from, you know, blank screens know. to uh, no engagement to not even signing on. And I don't want to paint the picture that if you're in my school online or Pasco E school, that, that that's that's what it is across the board because it's not. It's a very small number. But I, the other point I want to make is that the commissioner, uh, the department, has been precisely clear about progress monitoring. Mm -hmm. We instituted the NWEA assessment, the MAPS assessment, um, in August. We did that over the summer knowing that we needed a baseline of knowing where our students were academically. Um, and uh, we gave that assessment in August. Valuable data, valuable data. Uh, we will now, the wind has actually opened up today for the second MAPS assessment. And then there will be another one, I believe, in March. Uh, those are the three assessments that, that we're giving. Uh, very quick assessment, but it, it sees, it tells us where our kids are and what progress they're making. The state, we are now entering into an agreement with the Florida Department of Education to share that data with them. We didn't want to, well, I should say we didn't want to do it, but it wasn't our idea to do that. They are telling us they want the data. So what's that tell me? They are going to be looking, they're going to be watching what districts are doing as far as the supports that we're providing our students and the progress that they're making in ELA and mathematics primarily. So, um, our schools, it's, in, it's incumbent. There's, there's, no, there's no wiggle room in this. That NWEA assessment will be administered in all of our schools where it's, where it's uh, eligible um, uh, in, in December and in March. Because, not because Tallahassee's watching us, it's because it's the right thing to do. It's valuable data. It's valuable data. We need to know where our kids are. Sorry to sound like I'm on a soapbox this morning, but, but uh, no, it, it, it goes back to, to the commissioner's order. It goes back to the progress monitoring. Uh, it goes back to the plan and the assurances that we've got to give Tallahassee uh, that we are, in fact, uh, doing everything we can, including adding the additional supports for the kids that are struggling and the kids that are struggling and they choose to stay in the virtual environment. Right. We've got to ensure that there are additional supports which, and I will just tell you, it doesn't come cheap. So Ms. Swinson and I and others, we talk about uh, the funding piece and how we're gonna be able to get the dollars that we're gonna need to have in order to provide these supports that the department expects us to provide to these students. And we just need to really keep encouraging the families to be on mm -hmm. it with the students. Well, mm -hmm. they have got to, it's a Monitor sticky. It. We've got to be a partnership. With it's a, a sticky and, wicket. And, and may I yeah. add something as well, uh, Madam Co-Chair? Oh, sure. <laughs> I was just going to say there's different reasons why children are struggling, and so right. there's an analytical piece to this. I would imagine we we have to break it down. I mean, some it may not be because they're not they're not showing up. It may be because they're just not good at it virtually. So there's a lot going on here right. that we have to be responsible and look at. You're, right. you're correct, Madam Chair, if I may. Um, you are correct. Bad grammar, look at, but you know I meant. <laughs> uh, you are correct. There are varying reasons why students uh, are, are, 
are not as successful as other students in any environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the eyes of the department, from, from the way I look at it, is that there are students in the traditional model, there are those in the innovative learning model, and then those in the virtual model, which is the My School Online. They don't make any differentiation about really right. anything else. Mm -hmm. They do, they, they really focus though on uh, 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 ESOL, uh, low-income students, uh, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Students and with disabilities, yeah, I remember. Yes, the, the, our SES numbers, and they really need to make, want to make sure that we're providing those supports for those kids mm -hmm. I'm grateful for the department having allowed us to continue yeah, uh, the virtual uh, or innovative learning model uh, for the second semester. I am grateful for the department uh, holding districts harmless, even though it may be with some caveats. Uh, it could, I will tell you, I'm a glass half full kind of guy, it could have been a lot worse uh, than what we believe where we find ourselves today. I'm not telling you that it's a rosy picture because money is tight. Money is incredibly tight. Um, but uh, we have, uh, the expectation is that we will meet the, uh, the requirements of that plan and that plan will be filed timely and uh, then the hard part comes and that's the execution of that plan. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I mean, those are things that we all agree that we need to do yeah. anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to listen to the whole press conference, but it's my understanding that Commissioner Corcoran did give a thanks to you and to Superintendent Greco for helping him with some input about what's going on in the uh, district. So I really appreciate you taking that time to, to do that, and I'm sure that was uh, helpful to getting to the point that where we are right now. So thank you. Well, Madam you. Chairman, I, I, I'll take your, your thank yous, but... Uh, the Superintendents Association uh, as a body, and I have to be obviously as past president uh, on the, the committee that was working on our letter to the commissioner. So I, <laughs> I would like to think that the, the reason the commissioner called my name out was because the first name on his tongue since I'm his superintendent. Um, but uh, yes, we've worked hard and uh, they have been responsive to superintendents. A great deal of what's in his order is as a result of superintendents across the state um, uh, working with the department, which is which is great. I mean, it, like I said, it could have been a lot worse. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I have, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Gad. I don't want to steal Betsy's thunder, but um, I do want to draw your attention to the picture up there on the screens of Kirkland Ranch Academy and. Thank Peter Hepner. Um, this is my favorite picture of Kirkland Ranch Academy. It's kind of stylized. And uh, you're going to see a presentation about it today. And I'm really excited because we're making a lot of progress. They're turning dirt. They're probably ahead of schedule. If you're not, don't tell anybody. Um, uh, but uh, And the, the funny thing is when you stand on Curly Road and look up the hill at the school, it, it does appear that there's a big plateau up there where the school's going to go, and the locals in that area are now referring to that site as Mount Kirkland. <laughs> so it's just kind of amusing because the locals are watching it go up. Anyway, we're very excited about the progress that's being made out there. All right, Mr. Shipley. Just very quickly, there is an addendum to item 10.1 that has been uploaded into board docs for your consideration this morning. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chairman, if I may, because Mr. Shibley, I thought he was going to say something. We will be going into an, uh, an executive yes. session, closed executive session, immediately after this board meeting for the purposes of collective bargaining. Mrs. Cooney. Good morning, honorable board members, attorney Alfonso, and staff and visitors. Um, Sergeant Morrison, standing right here, may be wondering why all of the law enforcement guests are here today. And so I uh, wanted to surprise him a little bit because this is his last board meeting working with us before his retirement. And just wanted to say a few things about him and share with you. In January, Sergeant Morrison will be retiring from the Sheriff's Office after 25 years of distinguished service, most of it working with youth. He spent five years in patrol before moving into juvenile investigations and then served as River Ridge High School's SRO for 14 years. In May of 16, then Corporal Morrison was promoted to sergeant and was assigned to patrol. And then a few months later, he decided to come home back to SRO and has served in the role he's currently in as the leader of the District 1 SRO team since then. 
You probably are aware that Sergeant Morrison was part of the core team that created and implemented the active threat plan from the ground up. That was before um, many other districts were doing it and he was part of that core team that worked many, many hours to make sure that that was done and done in the way we wanted it to be done in Pasco County. He also helped to train all of the school board employees, law enforcement, public safety communications, and that model has been recognized across the state as one of the, the best practice models. We've worked with him here at school board meetings. He's helped us with community feeding, traffic solutions, rezoning, threat assessment, the list goes on. He's a trusted advisor, patient problem solver, and friend to the school district, and we wish him the very best in retirement. So I wanted to thank him for his service. Aww. And then additionally, we also have a Corporal Clint Gilmore here who is retiring after serving as an SRO for 20 years at Seven Springs Middle School. And so, I asked Mrs. Gant from Seven Springs if she had anything she wanted to share, and she sent me the following. She said, Corporal Gilmore has served the Newport Ritchie community as a school resource officer at Seven Springs Middle since 2001. His dedication to student and staff safety, positive attitude, and smile have been appreciated by our community. He has worked alongside administrators and teachers for 20 years to ensure that our students have felt safe and protected and had positive experiences with law enforcement. Every year he has taught monthly lessons to our sixth grade students on making positive life choices. He has made a positive impact on so many students as he has served as a mentor and positive role, male role model to so many students. Thank you for your dedication to Seven Springs and Pasco County Schools, and you'll always be a Jaguar. Madam, Madam Co-Chair, may I add something? Madam Co-Chair? Yes. I just want to, oh. oh. <laughs> I'm getting a little choked here, sorry. Cor Corporal Morrison was the SRO for all three of my kids at River Ridge. And I just have nothing but kind words for um, everything he did there. And I know the relationships that he created with the kids was incredible. And I know you kept a lot of kids out of trouble because of your relationships you had. And I cannot thank you enough for, um, oh, stop this, all you've done for our kids. And um, so was it Sergeant Gilmore? No, I'm this. Corporal Gilmore. Corporal Gilmore, okay, I'm sorry. I don't know you as well, but thank you. I'm sure that you have done the same. Thank you both very much. And I'm happy but sad. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah. So you're supporting them today. We have Captain Davis, Lieutenant Ferguson, and then you also have all the sergeants, including um, Sergeant Oakley, who will be replacing Sergeant Morrison upon his retirement, Sergeant Maggio, and Sergeant Justice yes. as well. Stand up. Yeah. So you don't get to and Mike Domaisi. All right. Well, we, you're going to be missed, but uh, you know, after six months, you can come back. And <laughs> I have already tried that. I've already tried it. It's not working yet, but fingers crossed. Mike Baumeister and I are working on it, so yeah, fingers so. crossed. Yeah, that's great. And additionally, um, as Mr. Gad mentioned, item 11.1 .1 is in today's board agenda, the GMP with creative contractors for the Kirkland Ranch Academy of Innovation. I'd like to invite Mike Goody to the podium to introduce the team working on the Kirkland Ranch Academy of Innovation, which opens in August of 2022, to share a presentation regarding our progress on this exciting project. Good morning. We have some exciting things to share with you this morning. Um, as Mr. Gadd stated, we are underway with the site work out there and we're on schedule to be open in uh, August of 2022. I want to introduce a few folks to you and then we'll show you some, some of the presentation. Um, from my staff, Carrie Lazari is back here. She's a project coordinator. Carrie's been working on this project now for a couple of years in the pre-construction, programming, design, working with superintendent staff working with uh, Dr. Romano's CTE staff and numerous others. Um, Creative Contractors is the uh, construction management firm and with us today is Josh Baumstein and Jim Cassini. They've done a lot of work for the district so they're probably familiar faces to you. And our design firm is uh, Hefner Architects in conjunction with Canon Design. And I'm going to ask Peter Hefner to come up here and share the presentation with you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair, board members, superintendent, if you can't tell with this mask, I do have a big smile on my face. <laughs> this is a milestone. This has been um, such a valuable experience for the entire uh, design team and all the folks that um, Mike just mentioned. But 
before I, I show you the photographs uh, and, and the slides, I, I really want the board members to know, and I think you do know this and you've seen a lot of great projects during your tenure in this district, but the, uh, just the horsepower and, and the support that we've had from this district has been overwhelming from the beginning. The leadership of the superintendent and um, Mr. Gad and everybody really in this room, uh, it's, it's so valuable to us as, as designers because it really lets us exercise our talents to the greatest degree. And it's the input and all the workshop and the decisions and the, you know, I don't want to mention people because I'm going to leave so many out, but um, Dr. Moore's leadership when she came in and joined the district has been, uh, it really lets us do what we, what we do well. And, and this is an example of that and I appreciate the opportunity to represent so many people that have done a wonderful job. Um, I, I think Mr. Gadd already talked about um, the image there, so I'm going to get into it and, and give you a brief overview. Um, I think for those that aren't familiar with the location of the property, we're about three miles due east of I-75, right on the uh, eastern edge of Wesley Chapel. Uh, we're about three miles north of Watergrass Elementary School. Um, this is uh, about a 104 acre piece of property, which is the northwest edge of Kirkland Ranch. Uh, for those of you, it's right on Curly Road that, that have not seen it. It's a gorgeous piece of property. It actually has over 40 feet of elevation in it. And for an architect working in Florida, <laughs> we, we, for once, we, you know, most of our properties are, are flat. So we it's really <laughs> took advantage of that. And I think that um, uh, working with, uh, with the district, we really felt that we wanted to maintain the beautiful natural um, characteristics of this piece of property. You can see the blue areas and a beautiful existing pond with oak trees and uh, we, we're hoping maybe we can still keep a couple of the cows out there, right, Mr. Gap? But, uh, but our civil engineer went to great extents with our landscape architect to expand that pond with our retention instead of just having your normal retention ponds. This is going to be a beautiful feature. Um, the building that you see in white up there sits on the crest of the hill. Um, and uh, it's specifically been designed as a courtyard school with security foremost uh, in our minds as we design this school. And you can see there, there's a very nice boulevard that's going to be built on the south edge of that property that aligns with the uh, residential development across the street. And then all the separate areas are very well defined. There will be ample room for stacking and all types of pick up and drop off. So there'll be no issues with that at this school. And then you can see to the east, a, a large portion of the property has been maintained for a future uh, K through eight school. This is what the front entry will look like when these students arrive at this school, when the community embraces this school. We've specifically designed this very large portico, if you will, that will not only be an entry to a school, but an opportunity for large community events. On the right hand side is the admin and then the left is uh, innovation center. Here's as you walk in towards underneath that portico, you can see it's been designed to allow a little bit of natural daylight coming in, but the courtyard beyond is very secured and the first place that folks will enter to the right will be the administrative suite. This is a diagram of the first floor of that building. As I said, it it's designed with a courtyard. The idea is to give these students and future students an opportunity for exposure of all these different exciting programs so that they can find an interest, see what other students are doing. Most of the CTE programs are all on the first floor along with the, um, we're really, it's a media center, but we're calling this a collaboration hub, an innovation center. It's a lot different than a typical media center. Um, and the first area is the administrative suite, as I've said, and you can get a feel for what it might look like inside. It's very um, modern design with a lot of nice materials that reflect uh, how the building is put together. The opposite side is this uh, collaboration hub, which will be a double volume space, really designed for an opportunity for business, uh, the community to come in, uh, share ideas. It's, uh, it'll function as a media center, but it's also intended to 
house a lot of other functions and provide great settings for entrepreneurialship and, um, and other academic endeavors. This is the second floor. Looking down, there's these spaces that are designed called huddle spaces for small meetings and collaboration. And then this is another view from the, from the top. Uh, moving into, uh, I want to give you a taste of a few of these CTE labs. Up in the upper left-hand corner, these are your digital media, engineering, robotics, uh, biomedical, and patient care. And there was a lot of thought put into the adjacencies of these spaces, so how each one can hopefully support each other. The thought is, is that here's your digital media, very flexible, open spaces. And as you can see, the... Um, each space will be designed with these murals that are very well thought out that reflect the curriculum and what's happening inside the spaces. And we've made a, a large effort to have some view windows going back and forth from uh, the different labs so that students can um, always see what other, what's going on in other areas. Here's the robotics lab, specifically uh, adjacent to the biomed with the thought that hopefully in the future these bright students that are working on robotics can hopefully design robots that will have something to do with biomedical education. And here you get a feel for the engineering lab. Um, very flexible spaces that are designed to change over time. Um, this is a student dining area that's designed. This is really one of the largest spaces in the school where the students can come together. So we've designed this in a way where it can be multifaceted for not only dining, but events and, and that, those type of activities. To the rear here in the blue are all of these very large double volume type of uh, CTE programs that consist of the automotive, the diesel, welding and construction. And you can see these very tall spaces, all designed with the newest technology. Um, this diesel program will be one of few in the state. There's not a lot of diesel programs. They're in very high demand. This uh, lab will be set up to handle anything from a F-250 truck to a very large vehicle. We'll probably, we talked at length with your transportation folks about bringing buses here to be worked on. So that, these, these spaces are set up to handle some really big um, rigs. Welding, full-blown welding. Welding has become incredibly popular and then we have two, our building trades and our um, electrical are side by side and designed where they can actually open up to each other. So as they, as they change in the future, these two labs can work together. Here you can see the, uh, the electrical side. And then this is a really exciting thing that, um, that is done at this school. A lot of this, I remember sitting in, in Mr. Gad's office talking about this a long time ago and he was, as we're working with business leaders in the community and we said, uh, why not have an OTIS office here at the school? This district is one of the largest, if not the largest employer in Pasco County. So why not have the district's OTIS working right out of the school, right next to the kids that are learning technology and cybersecurity? Not a bad idea. We've got glass where they can peek in. They can see all the data racks and how the whole school is designed. And it might not even be a bad idea if some of these bright kids eventually work for the district. And um, so it's really that kind of partnership that we were able to feed off of as we designed the building. Here you can see the cybersecurity lab. And then the second floor of the building, all situated around the courtyard. These are where all of your academic core classes are. And you can see we've got the different areas. And one I'd like to bring to your attention in the front right is the business electives. And that's a very important component, I remember, uh, working closely, we're all working with Dr. Moore on this to make sure that every student, every student is going to leave the school with certification, but they're also going to understand how business affects what they study. And the business electives, I believe there's probably three that each student will take, but they're designed to be uh, uh, intertwined with their actual CTE program that they are taking. But but these kids are going to learn about entrepreneurship and business just as much as foreign language, math, or social studies. So we've designed these different areas with the idea that each one will be situated around a pod, if you will, in the middle. You can see the classroom surround a center space. This is still a high school. These kids are going to be very 
uh, driven and committed to what they're doing, but it's still social. So we really wanted to make sure we had these nice spaces where they can have opportunities for social events. We're thinking these little collaborative areas are where community is going to come in, they're going to give lectures, they're going to show projects, they're going to do experiments. And um, this is what that area will look like, and the classrooms will surround it. So each of these uh, pods will have its own different, distinct personality, color, interior design. And then uh, one of the pods, of course, is science. It's a little bit larger. Here's an idea of, of what one of your science labs are going to look like. These are going to be very flexible, very open. Uh, and here, their, their little hub outside, you can see it's a little bit larger. The thought, thought is, is there going to be uh, presentations, experiments, demonstrations, um, just a really neat, exciting space. And then finally, the, uh, I talked about the courtyard. The materials that have been chosen for this project are, are very enduring, if you will. There will be a very nice uh, um, patinaed metal with that site, uh, that drawing that Mr. Gadd alluded to. But the courtyard was really designed not only for the students to be protected, but to see what's going on within the school, but also to be very social. And as you can see here, a lot of covered dining areas outside, as well as to the left is a big stair that comes down, and we've designed a platform that will promote um, any type of uh, um, exhibitions, or there may be if there's a little bit of drama or music. But we set up these, these components um, that you really want, as well as a traditional high school. But so with that, as Mr. Goody said, we're uh, we're under construction pretty soon. You're going to start seeing the steel columns and beams going up, and um, we've got one of the best construction managers in the state of Florida. So um, again, we really appreciate this opportunity. This is going to be a success, and um, thank you very much for allowing me to present this morning. I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, Thank you. That's, that's great. So Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you. Madam Chairman, if I may, let me just, while Peter's up here, and, and Josh just goes for you guys as well. Um, these guys have been so patient with us. Um, how many iterations that we've gone through, what you've seen today. Um, I can't thank Peter Hepner and his firm, as well as Canon Design, and then Josh Baumstein and his, his crew at Creative. Um, uh, this is uh, this is just going to be a great project, uh, and it's just not uh, just in East Pasco, but it's going to have impacts all over the district. And um, and I'm just so grateful uh, for your patience uh, and your professionalism uh, and your attention to detail. Um, it will be uh, it'll be a, a true asset uh, for the entire Pasco district. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Peter. Your interiors always blow me away too. Thank you. I just wanted to add. Thank you. Anything else? No, thank you very much. All right, uh, Dr. Moore. How do you follow that great presentation <laughs> of our new school, which is going to be our crown jewel until we build our next one? So good morning, honorable school board members, Superintendent Brownlee, Alterna Fonzo. As usual, I'm excited to be here to give some highlights from the career technical and adult education family. As you will note in your board packets, the EET grant has been submitted. This grant is for advancing career and technical education through entrepreneurship, education, and training. It's a competitive grant, and we are excited, and hopefully we will receive it. Uh, also, Governor DeSantis has extended his executive order through December 20th, 
of December 2020, allowing the Department of Health to modify existing statutes that govern certain health training programs. And what does this mean to us? It means that our CNA teachers are allowed to substitute simulation of patient care in their classroom labs instead of going into healthcare facilities for clinical training due to COVID. Several of our programs are using an improved clinical simulation module instead of clinical training in a healthcare facility to fulfill their clinical training requirements. While some schools were able to get into a partnership with clinical facilities for trainings, others were not and are now using the simulation instead. Also want to let you know that our CTE button is live on our PD Hub page, so we're very excited for that. And that gives us the opportunity to provide training to all of our wonderful CTE teachers throughout the district. We do have six CNA programs that are licensed and have been approved and renewed by the Board of Nursing. The new program licenses run through December 2022. So that's important because all of our programs are now licensed. We're also finalizing our new clinical affiliation agreement between Advent Health and Zephyr Hills and Wiregrass Ranch High School CNA programs. This agreement will allow Wiregrass Ranch High School CNA students to do their clinical training at the, their facility and Zephyr Hills CNA students will also be able to go and do their clinicals there. And this is important for our upper level students because they need the clinicals in order to earn their certification. In the world of adult education, um, Marchman has begun its nomination process for the National Adult Education Honor Society. And the class of 2020 will feature 15 adult education uh, new inductees. And so we're very excited about that. We've also had four of our welding students, as we just heard from Peter, welding has become an extremely important critical shortage field. So we have four students that have just earned their D1, uh, D1 test, which is a 3G position. And it's a very difficult test for students to uh, pass. So we want to recognize Henry Ulmer, Nick Rindal, Kevin Wood, and Austin Wabnitz for their excellent work. And then last but not least, I always like to leave with a positive story. I'd like to share a story about Chris Angelella, who is a student in his third year at uh, Marchman Technical College in the adult general education program. He is studying adults with disabilities. He was recently nominated as a student of the month for October. And what makes this unique for Chris is that this year Chris has published his first book on Amazon titled Dottie's Freckles. He, Chris was the author and co-illustrator and um, the book deals with students with disabilities. So we're very excited for Chris and his new endeavor. And if you're interested, you can purchase the book on Amazon. So thank you very much. Thank you. How cool. All right, uh, Mrs. Swenson. Uh, nothing for me. I'm in the process though of calculating what governor said yesterday, so I probably would have an update for you next meeting. All right, thank, thank you. you. Mrs. Hilton. Yes, I'm going to <clears throat> ask to just um, change the um, pattern today as my presenter has um, escaped the room, and so we'll hear <laughs> from some of the schools first. Okay. Hey, good morning. It's my great morning. pleasure to introduce two leaders that we are recommending as principals, one at Gulf Trace Elementary and the other at Watergrass. We certainly um, are sad to let Mr. Mitchell, Scott Mitchell, retire, but we wish him all the best as he is, has decided to do that. But let me start with Kara Abatello. Kara is um, the recommended principal for Gulf Trace Elementary School. I knew Kara even when she was a teacher at Trinity Oaks, not, yep, Trinity Oaks. Um, and at the time I recognized in her um, a very strong instructional leader. She is very willing to explore, try new things. Uh, she would do anything 
to help a child be successful. And so Kara um, has been an AP at the Mary Giella Elementary. She was an AP at James Marlowe, and now we're recommending her as a principal at Golf Chase Elementary School. So with her is her husband, John, to help celebrate. And also, um, Mr. Papa Emanuel was here, he <laughs> snuck out. Um, but George and Kara were a great team at Mary Giella and improved that school. Um, so uh, we hope that you will accept this recommendation for Kara as a principal at Mark. <laughs> So I also get to introduce um, Andrea Altman, and Andrea is being recommended as the principal at Watergrass Elementary to replace Mr. Mitchell. Um, Andrea has been an assistant principal. Her, her current um, position is at Call Hollow with Kara Schmucker, but she also was a assistant principal at Raymond um, Stewart Middle School for, for multiple years. Before that, she worked at Veterans Elementary School as a learning design coach, a literacy coach, and of course as a teacher. Um, if you know Andrea, you know that she is a learner at heart. If Andrea doesn't know something, she is going to work extremely hard to, to fill that gap and, and, and become an expert at, at whatever it is she needs to do. She is very innovative in her approach. She is a change agent um, as a leader. And we're super excited to recommend her as the Watergrass Elementary principal. With her is her daughter, Rachel, who goes to Sanders, um, her husband, Eric, and Eric's mother, Margie, here to celebrate Aww. Andrea. So we um, recommend her as the principal at Watergrass Elementary. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Mrs. Hilton, do you want to go back to you, or do you want me yes. to continue on? That will be great. Thank you so much. So much. Good morning. Um, as you know, we've engaged with Gallup um, to administer both staff and student engagement surveys in our district for many years. And we use this data to monitor goals in our district success plan and related to our key priorities, specifically our priority of collaborative culture. We have received the results of these surveys released today, and I would like to invite up Dr. Peggy Jones to share with you this morning. Good morning. Good I morning. am thrilled to be a part of um, the meeting today to share these results with you. Um, on your screen, you see a brief um, PowerPoint that I'm just going to kind of walk through. I've also provided you with two documents that were paper clipped together. One is an overview of Gallup, and so it talks a little bit about um, background, some changes that have occurred, number of questions, um, number of responses. And then attached to that is a, what we call a scorecard for Pasco County. And so this would be everybody included in this one, um, and it looks something like this. We will have scorecards that will be published for every school for the district and then for school levels. So elementary, middle, high school, and ed centers, those will be published um, as we speak uh, to the website under the Accountability Research and Measurement Department. So with that, a um, couple things just for reminders. And so last year we talked a little bit about the sorting effect. We won't do that this year. Um, however, I did want to just do a reminder that there really are three types of employees that are measured through this particular survey. And one is engaged, not engaged, and then actively disengaged. And this is really what they look like, right? So your engaged employee is the person who's just going to go out and really help you and do anything they can, and that's on a daily basis. They're all, they come ready to be involved in work and enthusiastic for what they're doing each day. Your, on the other end, your actively disengaged employees, probably not the happiest employees to be there. Um, they're really um, more on that negative mindset. In the center are these not engaged employees. These are the folks who really are, they're kind of there, it's a job. They could move toward actively disengaged. They could also get pulled into engaged. So with Gallup, they've really had about 25 million responses. 
And so when they're looking at their data, they, they have a nice research base to fall back on. The key piece that, they, that we work on with them is that this is about engagement. And engagement versus satisfaction, what does that mean? Engagement is about that involvement, that enthusiasm for, what, for being at work, for what you do each day. Satisfaction is really a contentment. It's okay, I'm here. I'm not unhappy, not really happy, but everything's fine. And so what we're really looking at is engagement. These are our historical records. And so if you look at the very first blue circle, what you'll notice is on the first line is the year. Second line is the grand mean. And the third line is the percentile rank. And so um, as with most organizations, the lowest um, score is really that first year. And that was true for us as well. So 2014 is when we first gave our survey to everyone. So we kind of started out with a, with a few people in 2013. We went to all of our staff in 2014. And this is a key piece too that what you're looking at is the employee engagement piece. Um, so from, so after 2014, you saw that our percentile rank jumped up quite a bit. And 2015-16 uh, kind of looked similar in that 30 range, jumped into the 50s. Um, and then we took a dip last year. But then if you'll notice, we've actually peaked back up this year. So we're at the 47th percentile with our score this year. We've also seen a uh, tick, an uptick on the grand mean, which went up about six hundredths of a point. Dr. Jones, can I ask a quick question? Of course. When was this given to our employees? Mm -hmm. It was given in October, so the first two weeks of October. Okay, so this it was year. during the COVID yes. craziness. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's good to see. Mm -hmm. And a, a key point to that, too, for Mamus Harding, is um, we give it at the same time each year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so when you want to compare results, uh -huh. you're able to do that because it's at the same time. Right. We also overlap the student survey in that same period of time. The student okay. survey runs a little longer but it's in that same period of time as well. Okay. So this is really our engagement index across time. And so what you'll notice is that it's showing the percentage of, of um, employees who are actively engaged. That's at blue. The orange is our disengaged employees, the percentage. And then our actively disengaged are in gray. The most current year is at the top. And then if you'll notice down toward the bottom, that's that 2014 year. If you look at 2014, that's when we had our largest actively disengaged. From there, we've really hovered in that 13, 14 percent since uh, 2015, really. Um, this year is our highest percentage of, active, of actively engaged employees at 47 percent. At the very bottom, you'll notice that the Gallup K-12 database is reported. And so one nice thing is, um, at this point, Gallup has really um, in, in, uh, partnered with lots of K-12 districts, and so now they're able to actually give us a comparison to those, K, those other K-12s yeah. as a whole. Yeah. And so it gives us much more meaningful information, because K-12 does look a little different than other organizations. Yeah, I was, can I ask? Oh, of course. Sorry. I remember when we started this that there weren't so many. Correct. And so now we have, do you know how many? Other districts, roughly, or? I don't know that. I can ask, okay. um, but I do not know that. But it's enough for them to uh, be able to get report a as a database. They okay. get a meaningful number. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, the far right-hand side where it says engagement ratio, that ratio is how many engaged employees that you would run into before running into an actively disengaged employee. And so, obviously, you want that first number to be the highest. If you look at the K-12 database, it's a 4.1 to 1. Um, we're at a 3.62 to 1, which is our highest since we've been giving the survey. This is just nice for us to just be, have as a reminder. These are all of the questions that are asked in the K-12. So we, we give the K-12, and then we also add some custom questions that are unique to Pasco County. So as you see, the way these are written, are, these are written, but they're also classified in a hierarchy. And that hierarchy gives a little bit more meaning to what the questions mean. So if you're really looking at one particular one, so for example, school districts, including PASCO, um, may see that I have materials and equipment that I need to do my work right. That's not always the highest number. Um, and so, but that's really in a basic needs area. And so what does that mean? 
One of the things that we know is that we can't just go off the number and look at the number. It really becomes, I need to actually talk to folks. So the next step after you get your data is have some conversations with groups of people, um, and ki including kids. Um, so sometimes what that might mean is, I need a computer and I want each of my students to have a computer, and until that happens, I can't mark that as high. So we don't know that's true unless we talk to people. However, those first two questions are really getting at basic needs in order to be able to be engaged in your work. The next set of questions are around the individual. So what's in it for me and what am I getting? And as you go up the hierarchy, then you move into that teamwork. And so then it becomes, who are the people who are around me, who I am working with in my work site, within my district? And then finally, growth. And that's really about what do I see for my own personal growth? What do I see about my future in this organization? And is there room for me to, to move up? So this is just for a little humor as we go in. But again, really, this is um, the piece that we just go back to. It's beyond just the numbers, and the next step is really to have that conversation with, um, with folks and to really ask them. And the nice thing is, is that there are some guiding questions, some that are provided in the scorecard, but really questions around if we come together, I may want to ask you on our team. So maybe I do it by PLC. What is it, what's an item that we feel like we want to talk about? What would make this item a five? So what would have to, what would we have to see in order for you, you to score this as a five? Not asking what you did or how you scored it, um, but you might even ask, do you still feel the same now as you may have in October? Of course, people may not even remember what they scored, but it's still a good way to get some of that information, and it opens the doors to conversations. This I throw in because this is good context. So as you look at this, what you're going to notice is this is really kind of four groups and engagement results for those groups. PASCO is in here. I will tell you that these data are old. They are from 2013. Um, so just take maybe about 15 seconds, kind of look, think about where you think PASCO is, and I will unveil these in just a minute. The key piece that I do want you to think about is the blue are our engaged employees. And when you look at these four bars, none of them are at 100%. None of them are even really in that higher level. So sometimes the questions I get are, shouldn't you have 100% of your employees engaged? I don't think 47 looks great. And so the, the question around that is, when we're measuring this, we're really measuring folks that are in those different groups. And every organization is going to have those groups. So it wouldn't be reasonable for us to see that 100%. So these, this is the unveiling. And if you'll notice, that first bar is the U.S. working population in general. So all folks, regardless, we just kind of went out and randomly sampled and, and gave the survey to them. Second column is Pasco County in 2013. The next one is Gallup clients who are in their first year, which is why I use 2013 data, because that was really technically a first year for Pasco. And then the following, the last column is 2013 Gallup clients who have actually been with Gallup for a while. So you would expect that to be higher. So in this one, I just want to kind of, again, remind folks, why do we do this? Why does Pasco County put money, time, and effort into this process? Why do we care about this? And so uh, one of the things that we know is that in business, when we look at engaged employees, we notice that in Gallup notices, this is research-based, that productivity increases, customer service increases, um, things that decrease, absenteeism, attrition, theft. So these are all important to us as well. So this is businesses in general, but as we said, they now have a nice database for K-12. And so when you look at that database, there are some things that are unique to K-12. One is, that on the item that talks about at work, my opinions seem to count, teachers, K-12 teachers nationwide, are going to be the least likely of any organization in the Gallup database to mark that high. 
And so that could be for whatever reasons, right? It could be that the federal government is telling people what to do, the state, the district, the school administration. Whatever it might be, that feeling of maybe being less empowered is going to make you feel like your opinions don't count as much. Um, additionally, 46% of K-12 teachers report high daily stress, and 69% are not engaged in their jobs. This is pre-COVID, um, and so we may see even more um, significant numbers this year if they were to do this again. Also, 62% of teachers who are engaged are less likely to leave the district. So that's important too when we are so um, in need of teachers and we want our good teachers to be able to stay and we want to have those uh, great teachers in front of kids every day in the classroom. And so these are reasons why this is so important to us and why we care about this information. So for fall, what does it look like? These are how our data look. Um, overall, you saw we had an uptick. If you look at this, you'll notice we had about 6,300 um, employees take the Gallup poll, and that's similar to years past. Last year was about 6,800, um, so we're within that um, ballpark for numbers. Uh, so still a fair amount of folks who did take it. Um, as Ms. Harding um, noted before, right in the middle of us coming back to a school year that looked a lot different than years past. Nothing that's really dramatically different than what we've seen in years past. Um, the recognition, which is question four, um, I've received recognition in the past seven days, did go up. It was a 3.4 last year to a 3.61 this year. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm actually telling you the student one. Pardon me, we'll come back to that. Um, but nothing that was significantly different. I'll, I'll show you the student one in just a little bit. Um, so we're noticing that it's about the same as far as the spread. The other piece that I'll point out here is these are based on a scale of one to five. So when you notice the gray numbers, those are levels one. Those are the percentage of people who would have marked that item as a one. And the dark green are the percentage of people who would have marked that item as a five. Um, as a point of reference, the way Gallup would define this is a, a, a marking it as a one, a two, or a three is a no. So a three is really a soft no. So the only yeses are fours and fives. These are our additional items. So these are the ones that PASCO gives um, that are um, you, unique to PASCO. So it's a good piece. Um, and these are ones that we really want to be able to get more information around um, things that are important to the district, including the, um, the executive leadership, which was an uptick this year as well. So again, I like this because it really talks to the fact that um, we want to invest in our employees. We want them to stay and we need to invest in them so that they will stay. And that includes their engagement as well as professional development. So with that I want to actually turn the focus to the student poll. And I want to start here by talking about the student poll has had another change. So when we first started giving the student poll, um, it had the domains of student engagement student hope and well-being. Then they moved that and they uh, provided domains for student engagement, student hope, entrepreneurial aspiration, and then career and financial literacy. This year they have changed and we have student engagement, student hope, belonging, and social emotional learning. We're super excited about these two new domains because they're really at the heart of work that we are doing. And of course, we're glad Student Engagement and Student Hope have been there all along. Um, there are some slight changes to the questions in Student Engagement, Student Hope. So for example, um, one question that used to be there was there's a mentor, um, that, that there's an adult mentor for each student that's no longer asked. So you'll see slight changes like that. 
So engagement is the involvement in and enthusiasm for school. Again, it's nothing too dramatic, but what I would like to bring your attention to, because we've talked about this in the past, is I feel safe at school. So I feel safe at school has been one that's been a concern for us, but it actually went up this year. For, and, and again, that might be one we need to ask students, but is it because our schools have made um, so much effort in making sure that schools are um, a safe place amid the virus and that people and our students are feeling that this is safe, um, a, a safe place to be, and therefore we're seeing that increase in those numbers. Hope is the ideas and energy that students have for the future. And a couple things here, it's really very similar to years past, but I'll just pull out a couple things. 65% of our students um, were able to say with, with a five that they know they will graduate from high school. 51% have a, know at the level of a five that they have a great future ahead. And so those are some um, things that we can feel good about. We know that our kids have some hope. Then I take you to the two new domains, belonging, which is the feeling of being accepted and included as a part of the school. These are some questions that we're really interested in. We're very interested in also seeing how they trend as years go on. Um, but a couple of things here, um, if you look at my classmates care about me, 14% mark that as a one. So they feel like they, their classmates don't care about them. Um, that's good information for us, something that we can use. Um, I feel like I belong at my school or my school is a good place for students like me. And so um, these are just great questions for us to be able to use as a part of our work when we're really looking at our student body. Social emotional learning, which is how people learn to understand and manage emotions and establish positive relationships with others. This is a key piece. As you know, our early release days last year had a huge focus almost entirely on social emotional learning last year. And our schools have been working very hard on this and we'll see uh, work on it as we start to um, move back into early release days in second semester. So these questions um, will help us with that work as well. Particularly at this point, question number one, which is an area that has been a focus for schools, really looking at student emotions and an awareness of that. So question number one, when I'm angry or upset, I'm very good at explaining what is bothering me to other people. So that, we have 29% of our kids who mark that as a one, that they're not good at that. So on the one hand, you might be concerned, but on another hand, what a great self-awareness that students can say that I'm not good at that, right? I don't know that maybe five years ago, we might have seen numbers like that. A couple years ago, maybe. Um, so these are just great questions for us to be able to use. You'll notice um, the second question gets at, if we have a disagreement, um, we can find a solution to our problem. And the last question, I'm really good at listening to my friends when they're upset with something. So 57% gave that a five. So they feel as though they're great listeners to other kids. So with that, I mean, one of the key pieces for us, again, why do we care about this? We know that kids who are engaged, as those on our screen, are going to get the most out of education, right, and, and have um, what we want in order to be able to reach our um, vision, vision and our mission so that um, all kids are successful in college, career, and life. But we also know that at the center of engaged students are engaged teachers, and so it's important for us to also know how our teachers feel. That I'll actually close with any questions. Any questions at this time? I don't have a question, but I just have to say you do such a great job of putting this together and explaining it. Every every year it gets better, and I know we've had outside people come in before, and I have said it before, but you really do a, a, the best job at presenting this information, organizing it for us. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good job. Yes, thank you so much for everything. Madam Chairman, if I may, and I'm not going to say yes. anything about this, but I will tell you, and, I, and Mrs. Harding kind of alluded to it, I thought she was going to when, with her question, um, and I'm not going to use the term that Mr. Gad uses, slap our backs a lot about this, but I will tell you that this is very, to me, very encouraging yeah. 
news in, in, where we find ourselves or where we have found ourselves for the last eight, nine, ten months with, with COVID. Um, and um, I will tell you, though, although it, it's somewhat positive, it still gives us a lot of opportunity okay. for areas to address, particularly the social-emotional learning piece um, and working with our students and our teachers and um, and even moving the district forward even more. So kudos, Dr. Jones. Yeah, that's I was alluding to that, so thank you, Mr. Browning. <laughs> All right, um, Mrs. Um, do you have any more? No, thank you. Okay, um, Mrs. Hetzler Nettles. Good morning. I just want to take a moment and thank our school leaders who are supporting their students with both traditional and virtual community service experiences. We've talked several times and shared some athletic and uh, fine arts achievements of students, but recently. I'd like to commend the many clubs who are active. And again, it's both traditional and virtual. Many schools compiled Thanksgiving food baskets for families. They collected thousands of cans and literally hundreds of pounds of food for their uh, students. And much of that work in middle school world was 100% student driven. So great job for the administrators in supporting their kids in those efforts. In a new twist, the Pine View Middle School IB caring students in their PBIS points they have the opportunity to purchase meal kits this month and to purchase socks. They do an annual sock drive. Um, but I thought that was a really awesome example of their caring um, community and how the students will be able to use their PBIS points that they earn throughout the day in school to participate in some of those giving opportunities. So kudos to them. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Poe. Yes. All right, and Dr. Isles. Good morning. Last year, I talked about Wiregrass Ranch High School and John Long Middle School being selected to be part of the Florida Civic and Debate Initiative for the Department of Education. I just want you to know that both of those schools are engaging in that and have started it for this year, which includes some training for the principal coaches and will be involving students as well. So we're excited to see the impact of this work. Additionally, I just want to recognize some of our schools that had students that were recognized for all state musicians. That was Mitchell High School, Land Lakes High School, and Wiregrass Ranch High School. And then I also want to recognize Zephyr Hills High School for making it to the semifinalists for football. That was quite an achievement for them. And then I also want to wish um, Mitchell a lot of success in Friday night's game against uh, Edgewater. And so we're excited to see them win, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. I think this is the furthest they've ever been, I yes, believe. it is. So yeah, it's super very exciting. Yeah. All right, there are no expulsion recommendations or hearings. Good news. Uh, that brings us to the consent agenda. Is there anything that uh, any board member wishes to pull? Okay, uh, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. To I, would, I would move to approve and the adding the um, items uploaded by Mr. Shibley to 10.1. All right. Second. Second. All right, uh, motion by Crumley, second by Bodwin. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. All right, that brings us um, to action items. Let me get to that. All right, and that brings us to the rezoning recommendation for 2021-2022, uh, final approval. Uh, this is regarding uh, Starkey Ranch, along with some uh, other small adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, entertain a motion. I'm so moved. Second. All right, uh, moved by Crumley to approve. Second by Bodwin. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. I know, I was thinking the same thing. Yes. Well, it's nice when There's you're a opening lot of a new school and people happen. want to yeah. go there. <laughs> All right, so now it brings us to individual um, board member reports. Uh, Mrs. Hardy? Yeah. So I just wanted to say I hope everyone had a great, safe, and restful, uh, restful break. I hope you took some time to unwind and relax, and I know that we're going to finish this quarter out strong. I also wanted to thank Mr. Browning for changing um, his mind about spectators um, with sports and also the arts. Um, we, all, we all know how important this is to our students. 
um, in our community. I do want to clarify, Mr. Browning, that this does include the arts, right? And um, the arts are allowed to have live audiences within utilizing the guidelines. And this inc includes utilizing their auditoriums with masks, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to bring up to you, Mr. Browning, that um, I'm, I think I brought this up at the workshop before even last board meeting, but I'm still seeing that there are different guidelines being followed at different schools. Um, and it's being brought up to me by students as well as teachers um, and community members. So I just wanted to um, make sure you're aware of that so that way we can kind of make sure that all schools are following the guidelines that we have in place. Yes, ma'am. Um, but other than that, I mean, that's it. All right, Mrs. Crumley. Okay, um, it's already been said, but I also wanted to congratulate Mitchell High School football, the football team, and wish them the best of luck uh, this Friday in Orlando against Edgewater. And I think you read my notes, but I was going to say the same oh. thing, thanking the superintendent. I'm just teasing you <laughs> for um, changing the restrictions on the spectators. And uh, I was actually going to ask for clarification, but he's already done it on the arts, so thank you. And I wanted to see um, if maybe after the first of the year, because it would take a lot of work, I'm sure, but we get such great information all the time from Dr. Moore on all the CTE goings on. And I thought maybe at some point in time after the first of the year, we could have a workshop on putting all the pieces together. And I know that would take a lot of time. So I want to give plenty of time for that. But Madam, there's just so much excitement going on and how it ties in with the new school and all the other schools. And yeah, it's, been a, it's been a while. Well, Prince. that's what I mean, yeah. Wendell Prin uh, and Marchman. It's been a while, so. We could do that. Uh, probably uh, we will try to get it in in January, if not first of February. And I'll speak on Dr. Moore's behalf. No, <laughs> no <laughs> rush, because yeah. I know y'all are so, yeah. so busy. Yeah, and I want to give plenty of time. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Oh, okay. I don't, then perfect. that may be different than what I was going to say, because I, I like it when you do it during the meeting, too, because then other people get to hear yeah. it. But if it's something else, too, then maybe we want to keep it at the workshop. Well, Madam Chairman, if I may, what we've, we've kind of seen a kind of a change in the way that we've kind of handled the meetings, uh, we believe that um, we need to have, like, uh, what I call smaller snippets of, like, highlights of things that we're doing. I believe that the, the a workshop would probably be more in line with what Mrs. Crumley's asking for and I think what other mm -hmm. board members are asking for because it is so complex, so big, and I yeah. think that there's going to be a lot more Questions. information okay. and you just need more time than, than, uh, than I think. Yeah. And it's your board meeting. If you want to hear the board I, meeting, we'll do it. Well, I agree. now that I know that we're going to add to it, I we, agree. Will, we will okay. have it. We will do it in the first meeting of February if that's okay. acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. And okay. I, Dr. Moore, you're so busy. I'm sorry to give you more to do, but it's just such good information. Thank you. Yeah, and Appreciate I'm, it. Yeah, I think we'd also like an update yeah. on how Wendell Crin Technical That's what, School is doing. Yeah, all yeah. the pieces. And we'll we'll yes. give you everything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for asking. All right. Um, Mrs. Bowden. Okay, so going along with uh, what you brought up about social emotional learning. I wanted to thank the Pasco County Council PTA and uh, district staff, Vicki Papa Emanuel, Amanda Medina, Linda Hughes, and Amanda Hughes for offering a mental health workshop for families. The district staff discussed signs and symptoms of mental health concerns and mentioned the challenge as handheld personal devices have become more prevalent as there have been increases in cases of anxiety. They talked about resources in our community and in our district. This was with the families. Um, staff also um, answered questions from parents, and they just did a really great job. And they gave up time, their own personal time, in an evening, you know, doing this Zoom call with the PTA and parent participation. So I really do appreciate them. That's good. Um, I also attended the AIM for Education, Take Stock in Children, and Pasco Education Foundation fundraiser. And I want to thank the foundation, the board of directors, and all the generous supporters who support our students and provide them with mentors and academic opportunities. And lastly, I also had written down, I wanted to thank the superintendent for revising his policy with regard to spectators. And I hope that we can all continue to be vigil, vigilant in following the guidelines so that we can move toward more spectators at student events. Thank you. All right, and um, 
I had the chance, uh, along with some other district staff, to s surprise Principal Joel uh, DeVince, um, DeVincent of S Paul R. Smith Middle School for being our Principal of the Year in our district. And it was just priceless as we entered the cafeteria to see him dancing for the students. <laughs> it was so obvious why he was the Principal of the Year because every student's eyes were on him. So you can really tell that he has those kids yeah. engaged in, in what the direction he wants to take that school. You had to have seen it to believe it. <laughs> There's a video. Yeah. Yeah. You that, 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 yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. But th that just mm -hmm. shows how important it is that, that piece to, to engage the students, to get them to be a good leader and get them to follow you. It's a little different than what you would do with adults, mm -hmm. but, but he definitely had their attention. So, um, and, and also I, I do um, like what you recommended uh, as far as attendance at events. I think the most important thing, it's consistent among all the extracurricular activities. So I think that is going to um, really help in the acceptance of the policy and the understanding of why it's important um, th that we have, I guess I shouldn't call it a policy, but th that we have that guideline in place. Um, so, so yes, so thank you so much. All right, uh, anything from the school board attorney? No, thank you, Madam Chair. And superintendent, any last words? No, ma'am, we will have, as I said, at the beginning of the meeting and closed, uh, collective bargaining session immediately after this meeting since we clear the room. All right. Uh, that brings us to um, this public comment for non-agenda items. And, and Madam Chair, if I can direct to the record, I don't believe any cards have been received for anyone who wanted to make any comments, so I'll spare everybody the speech. But I will note for the record that uh, there were two Let's Talk comments that were received, and the record should reflect that actually it was the same author of both comments, but they have been uh, sent to board members, and they'll be made part of the record. All right, the next board meeting will be held on December 15th, uh, 2020 at 6 p.m. in the boardroom. So now I need a motion to adjourn. Meeting adjourned. No Thank you. That day.